How long has it been? 20 months. 20 months. Have you cleaned up the Attorney General's office and accomplished what you wanted to accomplish in that time? I think that everybody would acknowledge that we have cleaned up the Attorney General's office, and it was not an easy job. It was harder than I expected it would be, even after Nancy Rogers had spent uh, eight months there and settled the place down. Uh, you know, Dean Rogers is a very scrupulous person, and she thought a lot of decisions should be made by her successor, whoever that would be, because they'd have to live with those decisions. So when I came into the office, and, and first of all, uh, in May of 2008, I was part of a group of officials who pressured Mark Dan to resign. Uh, we thought that the office had become dysfunctional under his leadership, the personal scandals and other things, and he did resign. And, and that's an unusual thing. You never saw any Republican officials, including Mike DeWine, ever pressure any of their cohorts to resign, whether it was Bob Ney when he ended up in federal prison, uh, or Bob Tapp when he was convicted on ethics charges, or Tom Noe, uh, any, any of those uh, people. So let's start from that. Then when I was elected and I went in, I had to address uh, HR issues, which were uh, terribly uh, disorganized in the office. Uh, financial issues, the office handles a lot of money, $377 million. We recovered in debts owed to the state last year, uh, and that was in disarray. The people I brought from the Treasury were surprised at how uh, lax the controls were on that. Audit findings and other citations from, from Mary Taylor, both in the regular audits and the special audits she did when Mark left office. Um, leadership issues, uh, legal issues. We resolved a proceeding finally last fall that potentially had the office being held in contempt of court for the way they handled the matter uh, under the prior administration. So uh, there was a lot of work to be done. It took many months to clean the office up and get it to where I could sleep at night. Uh, and now I think we're operating at a high level, uh, smoothly, and uh, uh, I think continuity is what the office needs more than anything. They don't need to go through yet another transition and starting over again uh, when we've uh, made as much progress as we have. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, is there room for improvement? I'm sure there is, and we work on making lots of improvements all the time, still. Yeah. Your opponent, opponent says that uh, the BCI needs a lot of improvement that you haven't addressed it. And that we asked why, and he said, "Well, it's and what what improvements?" And he said that, that it takes too long to get uh, results, and, uh, and it's so, so important to the uh, local county prosecutors. And I, what do you what do you feel about that? Well, that's what he says, but there aren't any uh, local law enforcement officials who really come forward and back that up. It's a lot of he said empty claims. Well, he said, who, who did he say? He had a public records request. And he no, but who, which prosecutor did he point he to? He did not. We did okay, not ask you know, him. I, I keep asking him who's, who's complaining. Uh, the sheriffs, the police, and the prosecutors, I think, are very happy with the work we're doing. Uh, you can ask your local sheriffs. Ask your local police chiefs. See what they say. Don't see what Mike or I say. Uh, but the reality is the crime labs did need a fair amount of work when I took office. Mike Kreitz and I both sat here and talked about that in 2008, the importance of addressing that. It happened to fall to me, and I have been addressing it. Uh, over the course of my 20 months there, the response times in the DNA lab have fallen from an average of 100 days when I took office, which is too long, to 71 days, which is still longer than I'd like, but we're making steady progress on that. And the big game changer there has been we sat down with the scientists, talked to them, what can we do to make this work better? Uh, and they came up with the idea of adding robotics to the DNA lab, which is like going from a little craft work basis to a modern assembly line. And we have added that, uh, and that is making a huge difference. And that's why the responses at times are falling. Now, what, what I've seen Mike do is hand out statistics where he averages all the time during my time there, which of course takes out any possibility of gauging any improvements that I've made from beginning to the end of my tenure. So that's an abuse of statistics. Uh, Actually, he did give you credit for improving the time. He just okay, he, he never had before. Yeah, so he just started to do a better job. Same. Well, uh, it's not clear to me how he thinks he'd do a better job. He doesn't give any specifics other than he'd bring in people to look at it and he would he would do an audit. Well, we've done all those things. In fact, we just went through the national accreditation process on our crime labs uh, over the course of the spring and summer, and we are going to be nationally accredited yet again. We have people from around the country, a couple from Canada, who go top to bottom at our crime labs and everything else we do out there, and they give us very high marks. Uh, but 
Uh, look, because we've cut the crime lab response times, we've been able to add some things like we're doing DNA analysis now on property crimes for local law enforcement. Florida and Georgia were doing that. There's a lot of property crimes committed by very few people, a lot of recidivism, and we're going to match those DNA results against the database, and that's going to be a, a sea change for local law enforcement. We couldn't do that if we hadn't cut the response times in the labs. And we're looking at the sexual assault kits to develop new protocols. A case in Cleveland was a case in point of how uh, a lot of these kits don't get tested, uh, and we think that they probably should, and we're going to be able to do that because we now have the ability to do more in the crime labs. All local law enforcement also know, and I've told the prosecutors this time and again, if they need any results expedited because of a particular case, or if they, their investigation happens to get the evidence to us late and the speedy trial clock is running, uh, we will turn it around on an expedited basis. All they have to do is ask. They know that. Uh, and, and many of them have done that in individual cases. Now, if we did that in every case, we'd just be moving the line. But uh, we had some cases recently, one in the Akron area, where we were asked by local law enforcement to turn around some DNA samples on a 24-48 on a hour basis, which we did and aided in the investigation of that uh, crime. So I, I think we're actually doing well. Every one of the law enforcement organizations in the state that endorses in this race, there's seven of them, including the FOP, Troopers for Safer Ohio, uh, and Police Patrol Organization, has endorsed me for Attorney General. If I'm doing such a bad job for them, why don't they want somebody new? It doesn't really add up. By the way, that's not Mike's water glass, it is yours fresh. <laughs> 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 he also said your uh, priorities are misplaced. He said, what do you mean? He's always got spent 1.5 million on public relations. Yeah, that's, that's a new criticism. He trotted out this morning, so I haven't really had time to assess what he's talking about. But uh, you know, he, he's he's just he's not up to speed in the attorney general's office. The work we do on technology in the office is critically important to our effectiveness, and it's been critically important to our effectiveness for local law enforcement. Talk to the police and sheriffs in your area and ask them about the Ohio Law Enforcement Gateway, known as OLEG, O-H-L-E-G, okay? That's dramatic improvements in technology where we now can get them, they have access to all the criminal database, criminal history information that we have from not only computers, which was true before, but under my tenure now, handheld mobile devices that they can have on the field, in the street. Uh, I get compliments all the time for what we've done to upgrade the technology. And some of that has been improving our website, and some of it has been improving uh, devices themselves. Uh, you know, if, if we were to operate uh, the Attorney General's office without trying to be on the cutting edge of technology, including social media tools for corresponding with local law enforcement, with consumer protection, crime victims groups, uh, we would be operating inefficiently and we would not be keeping pace with the criminals who are using all of these uh, technologies to further their ends as well. So I, I just think it's a misplaced criticism. And, and the, the salary numbers that I saw are, are you know, bogus. He's, he's lumping people in who do not do um, website development and other things, but I would still say all the work done on the website is very important. We just added a missing, missing persons portal on the website because Crime Stopper groups told us we, we've always done the Amber Alerts for children, we've done the Silver Alerts for seniors, we don't do anything for missing adults. They were right about that. So we're now adding, and these are the folks who were working on it, we're adding uh, missing persons portal, including missing adult cases. That's new. We're doing that because our technology is better and we can do those things. Uh, so I just think to, for us to disarm on technology when the criminals are armed on technology is, is you know, that's a 30-year 30, 30 out-of-date approach to law enforcement. So, so you can talk about the social media, the, the, the Twitter and the Facebook angle. Is that more for, you know, accessing knowledge or is it more for communication? That, that's a small piece of what we're talking about with technology. I mean, the way he's portrayed it, as I understand it, and again, I'm just getting a second hand from the press conference he had this morning, is that I'm spending $1.5 million to Twitter and Facebook. That's, that's not accurate, okay? There are two people who spend a small portion of their time on those things. They also work on things like the Law Enforcement Gateway, the Missing Persons Portal, et cetera. But you know, it's important for us to use all tools to communicate with the consumer advocates around the state so they know about scams and frauds and, and uh, some of the schemes that the financial predators are using in real time. That's our scam alert widget, which is proving to be pretty useful for a lot of people. The crime victims groups that we communicate with all the time to uh, bring them up to date on changes in the law and, and law enforcement as well, changes in the law, 
uh, new grant opportunities, other things. Real-time communications, you all know this, I mean, is, is critically important in this day and age. The government usually falls well behind the curve on that. We've tried to bring ourselves forward on the curve because uh, not only are we in the law enforcement field competing with criminals, but also it makes us more efficient. It saves, saves other things, saves us making phone calls, saves us sending out mail. I mean, that, that's, that's not the way of the future anymore. It's the way of the present. It has been for some time. I realize, I was, realize there's attorney-client privilege stuff here, but could you just explain in general terms your reasoning behind the uh, pension funds record request and the advice that you sure. gave? Sure. Uh, the, the Newspaper Coalition, and you, you know some of this, so, so speed me up if I'm going too slowly, uh, is trying to assess the state of the state's pension funds. And I think that's very legitimate, important uh, issue, and there are other states around the country where it's come to a head uh, as well, like Illinois and Colorado. Uh, they submitted a request. They tried to calibrate the request to work around the current <laughs> state law. State law in general has strong open records and open meetings laws, and we are the ones who train local officials in them, and we tell them all the time, if it's a close call, make it in favor of disclosure, because otherwise they could sue you. You'll have to pay their attorney's fees. And we're seeing that right now with some local governments around the state being sued because they destroyed some old tapes and things maybe even years ago, and, and it's kind of a mess uh, for local governments. Um, but here, there's a specific statute. It's Revised Code 148.05. It is special for the pension funds. The legislature passed it. I didn't pass it. It's law in the books that has to be enforced. And it defines what is a personal history record, okay? And it defines that as basically everything in the pensioner's file, name, address, but also contribution history, everything else. And what the law says, you can read it. I'm not giving advice here. I'm just saying what the law says. It says that information cannot be disclosed without the consent of the individual whose file it is. The request made to us said, well, give us what's in the file, but take out name and address. It's fine. I understand they're trying to protect the privacy, but it's not what the statute says. The statute says everything in there is personal history record. So, uh, you know, that's, that's what that is. I mean, it's notable the coalition certainly could sue if they thought they were right and the state would have to give them the information and pay the attorney's fees. They haven't done that. So I think they aren't sure of their own position. But what, what I did was I talked to the systems and said, I think it would be good if you would sit down with representatives of the coalition and see if you can work something out on this, whether they can get the information they need to exert oversight over the pension system, which is a very legitimate function for them, without you violating the law. And I believe that steps are being taken in their, their process of either getting ready to meet or meeting to see if they can try to uh, mediate that issue and reach a resolution that's mutually satisfactory. Uh, if not, then maybe people have to go back to the legislature and get the law changed. I mean, the legislature struck that balance. I didn't strike it. I have to enforce it, whatever it is. And, and you can look at the statute and see what you think it says. Now, Mike lobs a general criticism at me for that. But he's never addressed the wording of the statute, which is what the Attorney General has to do. I can't say what the law I'd like it to be. I have to deal with it as it is. So. You've been in office 20 months, and that's 